I guess we are live on YouTube. Should I start, sir? Okay, then I'll be starting. Dr. Deborah Thompson will be starting. You can turn on your camera. Okay, then. Good evening, everyone. Starting the session with the hope that everyone is safe and sound. I, Sarah Malik, your host for the day, welcome you all to this webinar session on science communication organized by Miltaomics. Success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love for what you are doing or learning to do. And today I'm very thrilled to announce that we have a very special guest with us on board. Please welcome our honorable speaker, Dr. Deborah Thompson. Dr. Deborah is the founder and president of One Health Lessons, a global organization that inspires children and adults to value the interconnection between the health of plants, people, animal, and their shared environment. She is the author of the book, The Art of Science Communication, that is available on Amazon. Dr. Thompson is a veterinarian, educator, and award-winning public speaker and musician. She has served as a science policy advisor in the United States Congress in Washington, D.C., where she focused on response to COVID-19 pandemic, public health, global health, climate change, and many other One Health topics. For years, Dr. Thompson has developed and taught lessons focused on the connection between human health and the health of animals and environment. She is passionate about the science field and other One Health lessons that are being taught in public schools, private schools, and online. The lessons have inspired over 2,000 children around the world to consider a future in science. Her seven free age-appropriate COVID-19 lessons are currently being translated into over 70 languages, including Urdu, by over 400 volunteers. And today, I'm very thrilled to announce that we have today with us on board. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. A very cordial welcome to you in this live session on behalf of Multiomics and our audience. Thank you very much for having me, Multiomics and Sarah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am happy to start sharing my screen and we will get started. As Sarah had said, this talk today is entitled The Art of Science Communication. I wrote a book on it recently. It's now published and available on Amazon, as Sarah has said. And the subtitle of that book is really sharing knowledge with students, the public and policymakers. So what I would like you to do if you are associated with Zoom or if you can chat on the YouTube channel, um, let us know what is your background. I want to know who's in the audience. I want to know your backgrounds. I want this to be a conversation. So if you can just introduce yourself, then that would be greatly appreciated. Now that Sarah has told you everything about me. <laughs> Let's make it fair. While you're doing that, we'll go over a game plan. Today, we'll go over four things. We're going to review widely used science communication techniques. Then we'll consider the trajectory of science support throughout the world. But with a particular example that happens in Washington, DC, where I actually live, then we will explore projected difficulties that we as scientists, we as STEM advocates um, might be encountering. And then together we'll solve these challenges. So Sarah, have you seen anybody write in and give some background information about themselves? Not right now, doctor, they are still joining in. That's why maybe they are taking some minutes with that. Okay, that's no problem. I imagine, um, Sarah, yes, if you don't yes, mind muting, yes, that would be great. Um, so I imagine that we would be a very varied audience and that's the beauty of science. That's the beauty of STEM. Um, the more 
uh, variety we have in a conversation, the better it is for the conversation to move forward. And it's not just that, it's gonna be a more interesting conversation. So looking forward to hearing more about you. Okay, so what is science communication? You can attend a whole day meeting about what is science communication, but honestly, let's just sum it up in a simple slide. It's the method of sharing knowledge with people outside of our niche bubble, whatever our bubble is. So as Sarah had described, I am a veterinarian and I am very comfortable speaking with other veterinarians. Why? Because we speak the same language. But before being a, sci uh, before being a veterinarian, I was teaching. And so I can communicate with teachers. I can communicate with scientists, and then I need to, as a professional, as a veterinarian, communicate with the public in order to improve the health of my patients, which are silent animals. So why is science communication important? Can anybody fathom a guess and write in if possible? And Sarah, any more updates from the audience? Uh, yes, Dr. Thompson, they are introducing themselves. Just let me get there and I'll just let you know about our audience. Most of them are students from universities, as you can see, and most of them are from biological background too. Like we have Fatima Iftihar from University of Lahore and she's final year. We also have Shanzi Riaz and she is student of final year MBBS. And we are again having, we also have student Maria Nawaz. She is doing MPhil in environmental sciences. And we are having other responses and Sanya uh, Zahra is saying, yes, communication is very important. And she's also a BS zoology student. So most of them are from biosciences background. Very good, very good. And I love seeing that there's um, a bit of a variety there because I heard environmental health science, um, which is absolutely important and incredible and vital to any forward moving science um, connections and uh, conversations. So why, <clears throat> excuse me, why is science communication important? It's really so we can advance science, right? And why would we want to advance science? Ultimately, if you whittle everything down to one thing, it's really to make people, animals, and the planet healthier and improve the well being of people. So let's name different audiences. Us as science communicators, can you just throw out some ideas of who you think you would be speaking to when you talk about your niche knowledge? Who are the people who would be listening? If our audience can answer the question that our respected speaker has asked, that would be great. And Sarah, feel yes. free to brainstorm as well. <laughs> yes, I will. I will, Dr. Thompson. But I guess we rush towards specialists in science and our teachers that can guide us well regarding our future or someone that is related to our field. Right, right. So people who are related to our field, that's definitely one of the possibilities of an audience. But here's a question for you. How far can we go in science if we don't have buy-in from people outside of our science bubble? Ask yourself that. And we're going to explore the answer to that question today. So different audiences, certainly the general public. There's working adults. There are people who don't have jobs. There are people who are literate. There are people who are illiterate. There are retired adults. And then there are people who are just starting their careers. There are family members. And then we can take it even further. Let's explore some influencers. And what do I mean by influencers? People who uh, make a difference in another person's life in a substantial way, who um, inspire action in others, 
So those would be politicians, teachers, journalists, community leaders, religious leaders. Can you think of anybody else? So if we can have buy-in, if we can have these people become science advocates, can you imagine what changes could happen? But the thing is, as a scientist, we as scientists, do we want to rely on another person to translate our science to the general public? Or, or do we want to have the capability and the skills to actually cut out that middleman and speak directly to the public? What do you think would be more direct? What would you think is more efficient? So here are some widely used science communication techniques that we will review. There's certainly social media, radio, television. You'll, you see the rest of the list. Now, what happens if your public, your target audience are people who are visually impaired? Well, then you work with the radio. What about people who don't have easy access to internet? Well, then you have to work through in-person education, right? And let's dive in a little bit more into the different techniques used in these formats. We can tell stories. We can tell stories with pictures and no other words. We can write stories, we can write books, we can have pictures without words, we can have pictures with words, and we can do exactly what we're doing right now and holding a webinar. So here's a question that I would like everybody to ask uh, themselves and answer if possible. Why? This is just, this has nothing to do with science, but it proves a point. Why does this advertisement not work for an international audience? You can see that somebody passed out in the desert, the person's drinking a, a soda, and then we're running along on the sand dunes. At least that's the way I interpreted it. How did you interpret it? Any ideas? Sarah, do you see any notes? No, uh, still people are talking about communication, I guess. Communication with media is also good, but local language, yeah, now they are just still talking about communication, okay. how important it is. And they are answering the previous question that having direct communication is more uh, effective than having a middleman. Yeah. Yeah, it truly is. It truly is. And so looking at this picture, I ask you. Yeah, they are seeing in the picture, nothing is clear. Okay. And does anybody have an idea why this advertisement is not ideal for everybody on this planet? Here's a hint. Think about all of the languages out there, including Urdu and Arabic and many others that read languages right to left. That would be the exact opposite effect of what the advertisers would want the consumer base to recognize, right? You want to, um, you want to share that having a soda will give you lots of energy instead of having you pass out. So the key here is really understand your target audience. And this is another infographic. And One Health is something that I'm really passionate about. One Health is the interconnection between the health of us human and the health of the environment, animals, and plants. It makes sense, right? A sick environment can cause sick people. Sick environment can cause sick animals, and that can also cause sick people. So we're all connected, right? And imagine if you see these infographics and you cannot read, okay? You're just seeing these infographics. You don't know the words that they say. Would this convey what you really want to say to your target audience? I'm not sure about that. 
I see that people have devoted a lot of time and um, energy in creating these infographics. And I think the colors and the simplicity is good, but really what do we need to do? We need to keep it even more simple and make it very clear for any audience. This is another example. So I explained what One Health is, the concept. It's um, the interconnection between our health and the health of the environment, animals, and plants. Now the One Health approach, actually it's what we're doing right now. The One Health approach is teamwork between people of various backgrounds, strengths, disciplines, and we come together to prevent and solve complicated health problems. And so the reason why I say that right now we're practicing the One Health approach is because we're coming from different backgrounds and we're learning together in order to further uh, advance the, your skill set in science communication. So as you can see, this infographic is quite complicated. It appeals in a fantastic way to scientists, especially One Health advocates, but do you agree it's a little bit complicated for the general public? Again, tailor your message to your audience. Know your audience. And now we're going to be talking about if you speak with, say, politicians, for instance, or children, for instance, or the general public, or people who work in federal government um, that can move, uh, funnel around some money to help with your research or work with a nonprofit or a non um, NGO, a non-government organization that can help fund or a foundation that can help fund your project. So again, tailor your message to your audience. And so the trajectory of science support compared to before, I have seen a, a increased amount of science support. But really, what does tomorrow hold? Um, this pandemic has certainly raised, um, increased the amount of people talking about science, which can be good, could be troubling if we don't have the right message appropriately delivered in the right way. So it's really up to us. That's the whole point of us talking today because I want you to improve your science communication skills just like I am constantly working on mine. Let's go over a few true stories and the possible challenges that are um, involved. This takes place in Washington DC where I was a fellow. I was a fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They're the ones who publish the Science Magazine. Um, so you probably have heard of them from that, in that respect. Um, and I was, my title was, I was a Congressional Science and Engineering Policy Fellow, which means that I was working in the federal government. I was working in Congress, particularly the United States Senate for one of the most senior senators in this country. Um, and I was the token scientist and it was an incredible experience. Um, I learned a ton that year and a lot of the material that I wrote in the book kind of came from that year. But going back to the story and the reason why I'm bringing up the fellowship is because this is me and I started a club. <laughs> I started a, it's called an affinity group with this person here who's a microbiologist. And this club within the fellowship network um, was focused on One Health. So in this one group, we have, like I said, a microbiologist, a veterinarian, we have an ecologist, we have a water specialist, we have a statistician, a mathematician, a physicist, um, we have a sociologist. So lots and lots and lots of different parts of science, right? And so we're all doctors one way or the other. We're PhDs or veterinarians, uh, so DVM or MDs. So we all have the doctor title. And the, the place where we were, you might see back here, it says outbreak. We were at the outbreak exhibit of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in Washington, DC for a field trip. And our guide was a friend of mine, Dr. Dan Lucy, who is um, an incredible infectious disease physician. 
Uh, and this outbreak exhibit was actually his brainchild. He thought this up and this was his dream and it came true. Thank goodness it came true. Um, so this particular um, exhibit was meant to was meant to um, educate the general public about uh, zoonotic diseases, so diseases that can transmit between different species, uh, including people, of course, and also infectious diseases in general, and how can we protect ourselves, and what were the stories um, of trying to find solutions to those previous outbreaks. Um, and that exhibit, actually, just for the benefit of everybody, because you're listening in from around the world, that exhibit has a mobile version to it and you can print it out, uh, print out the material and have it shared in person in your area of the world. And it's available in several different languages. So just check it out, Google search um, or search online, Outbreak Exhibit, Smithsonian. Um, I think it's a do it yourself version or something like that. So check that out. Okay, going back to this story. So Dr. Lucy was um, showing us this exhibit for a good three hours because we were all honestly geeking out. We were dorking out. We were just, the conversations were just incredible because there were some people who worked in different labs and it was really insightful. And we all really, really, really enjoyed this talk. Um, I was seeing people who were from the general public everybody who would be around this corner here, who I saw did not necessarily have the same um, reaction as we did. And I'm looking around and I see words like pathogens and I see words like physicians. And I remember asking a, a child who was about seven years old, another time that I was at the exhibit. And I asked him, what's a physician? He had no idea. I'm like, what's a pathogen? He has no idea. So there are some fantastic things that were happening in that exhibit, but keep in mind, you need to tailor your message to the audience. And given that this was a public exhibit with children and adults there, um, it, it, um, it sometimes uh, was a little bit of a challenge in the conveyance of some material. But when it came to the scientists, we really loved it. And the scientists are working throughout the federal government, the national, national government, and they are often in areas of the government that help direct funding uh, for science research. Now let's talk about the exact same exhibit, but with a different crowd. And you may or may not recognize this building from from different media services, but this is um, a picture of the Capitol building in the United States in Washington, DC. Um, this is the building that was uh, stormed by people on January 6th of 2021. And this is the place where the Senate, the uh, National uh, Senate uh, meets as well as the House of Representatives. So this is the area of our government in the United States that really creates laws and so we're talking about policy now. There was something like a field trip uh, for staff members of elected officials to the same exhibit. And the same type of presentation was given, not by Dr. Lucy, by another person, but the same stimulus was there, okay? We saw the exact same exhibit as what the scientists saw. And I saw the person who was leading the group speak a certain way and it just totally bypassed the needs and the wants and the interests of the policy people. And seeing this in real time, I was trying to help bridge the uh, two totally different conversations that were happening. But the thing is, I can't do that alone. I need you, other science advocates, to be aware of um, how to speak with other people other target audiences. And because it didn't land so well, um, if this continues, if we as scientists and engineers and anybody affiliated with STEM or STEAM cannot talk with people outside of our own bubble, 
then how far can we go with science and advancement of science and helping fund science? So asking you, who yields more power? Is it the people who make the laws and also figures out how much money goes towards different science funding and science projects? Or is it the people who direct the money? I would argue that it's the initial group, right? It's the ultimate source of the money. Because the ultimate source of the money can tell a certain agency, a certain area of the government, that this amount of money needs to be spent on this, okay, on this type of research. So yeah, another reason to convey our message efficiently, tailor your message to your audience. So let's explore some solutions. Regardless of what your scientific goal is or engineering goal or your personal goal, think about it in a few ways. You can think about it from the top down and if we're talking about science goals, thinking about talking to somebody of influence and having them um, talk about how important science is and that comes down to helping you or start small and move up. So start to have conversations with your colleagues outside of science or engineering. Um, start to build relationships with people who can then trust you and then trust your message. But it's, the thing is, when there are problems that come up, hindrances, we have to get creative and we have to find detours and we can't give up because science is too important to give up on. So let's discover some solutions to the science communication challenges. And please, please, please remember this slide. If you don't remember anything else, remember this slide. So practice makes perfect, right? And if you want to communicate, it's not just about speaking, it's about active listening. It's about having those relationships, building those relationships, building that trust. And the reason why I have something called Toastmasters internationally here is because it's available in over a hundred countries around the world. It's a safe place for you to practice your communication skills. Other community-based public speaking opportunities. Get yourself out of your comfort zone, okay? Get yourself out of speaking with other scientists. Listen to what's being said. If you're in school, think about joining clubs outside of science. And then that would mean that you would be the token scientist and you would have the ability to start conversations. And I would challenge you to actively listen to not only what people are asking you about science, but how they're asking you. What's their word choice? What's their reasoning why they didn't understand something in the past? And work with them to make sure that they understand and One Health Lessons. One Health Lessons is an organization that I started that inspires children and adults to value the interconnection between our health and the health of the environment, animals, and plants. In other words, One Health, right? And we have a train the trainer program with One Health Lessons and it's free and it's available to you as long as you are 18 years or older. When it comes to Toastmasters, there are several groups throughout Pakistan. And keep in mind that a lot of um, the groups around the world are doing virtual meetings. So you don't necessarily have to live in these particular areas, um, but there are possibilities to also uh, meet in person wherever it's appropriate and safe on this planet. Okay, so Time to improve science communication skills in real life and not just talk about it. It's with this lesson leaders program with One Health Lessons. And you can go to onehealthlessons.com and get this material and learn even more about it. You can also look at the YouTube channel with One Health Lessons and subscribe there and you'll get even more updates. If you wanna become a lesson leader is to attend a one hour online training session. The second step is to watch an entire One Health lesson be taught on YouTube. 
and it's a recording. After you're done looking at the recording, then you will be completing a quiz. And as long as you get 100% on the quiz, then you advance to the next level. And that quiz is really focused on um, pedagogy. So meaning um, teaching techniques, how is this explained, things like that. The third step after you pass that quiz is to observe a live lesson be taught. Um, just two weeks ago, there were 13 classrooms in Argentina taught. It was taught in English um, because everybody was bilingual there. Um, and I think next week they're scheduling uh, near Washington DC for several classrooms as well. So there are opportunities to watch live lessons virtually be taught. In addition, there is one One Health Lessons Ambassador in Pakistan and he has taught uh, several classrooms in person already. He's an ambassador and we'll talk about being an ambassador soon. He can also have you, if you live nearby and in person, or if he does this virtually, you can watch him teach in Urdu um, these lessons to children. And then you can fulfill step number three. Step number four, you are the teacher you are the person who the children and the adults are listening to. But don't worry, you're not alone. Somebody else who has already done this before will be, will be with you and will be providing feedback. Step number five is really bring these lessons home. Now, I did not create One Health Lessons for the English speaking world. I created One Health Lessons for the world. And it's been an absolutely incredible journey because this program started last year in May of 2020. And right now there are 84 languages in development for these lessons. So step number six is really getting out there into your community and teaching about the interconnection between our health and the health of the environment, animals and plants. But it serves even more purposes. You as a scientist, you as an engineer, you can then advance your science communication techniques in real time. Because honestly, kids are very honest. They don't hide their feelings. If they're bored, they show you. Um, and if you can communicate science to a six-year-old, to an eight-year-old, to a 12-year-old, you can then craft your message to meet the needs of adults too. So if you're interested, uh, sign up through uh, onehealthlessons.com and take a screenshot of this if you'd like, lessonleadersprogram at gmail.com. And just to ensure that something is clear, at step number four, after you've taught your first lesson, then you have uh, a certification. You are a certified um, lesson leader. Then after you teach at least five times in your own community, in your own first language, then you become a One Health Lessons ambassador. So we are always looking for more translators. We are looking for translators of these languages and more. We are not going to say no to any language because ultimately, again, I did not create One Health Lessons for the English speaking world. I created it for the world. And there are so many languages, fabulous languages on this planet. And the goal of One Health Lessons is to inspire every child and adult on the planet to value One Health. So if you want to volunteer as a translator, um, please contact uh, Abdullah, email address is below. Okay, I'm going to be leaving you with a few questions and pictures. Remember what I said about in the museum, the fantastic Smithsonian Museum, and there's this one stimulus, but it was interpreted by different target audiences differently, not surprising. This demonstrates as well, the same exact drawing on the front board in the classroom created three different images from students who were eight years old and they were taking notes. This person interpreted it slightly differently, but still correct. This person 
wanted to be quite um, artistic. And then this person wanted to be more simple. But regardless of their interpretation, all those interpretations are correct. And that's the most important thing. Everybody is an individual. Everybody's brain works differently. So it's important to make sure that your message is as clear as possible to make sure that the take home message is remem uh, remembered. Now, other things that you can do, uh, participate in global activities such as Earth Day. This was a picture that I took of all of recycled material uh, when I was bringing this into a school in 2016. And I was talking about One Health. This is something that I bring up with a lot of medical students. And I think it's worth also sharing with the general public. So hear me out on this. Yale University in Connecticut in the United States has a center on climate change and health. And when I speak with medical students, meaning human medical students, what I say is the patient that comes to you and looks for treatments is not just the, the living organism in front of you, be it a human or be it a cat or a dog or cow, whatever that being is, there's an environment that is associated with that patient. So you can't just look at the individual and think this is a closed system. No, you have to have a holistic approach. So take for instance, this terrible flooding situation. What happens if there's a farm back here and it's being flooded? And what happens if these men have cuts on their legs? Now, would they voluntarily tell you as a physician, as a human doctor, that they were walking through this? No, not necessarily, but you have to have the awareness. You have to have the um, respect of acknowledging the environment and the, uh, and the well-being of those around them to um, elicit the best type of treatment for that patient. Another thing to mention is that, say if you're an emergency physician, if you're an emergency doctor in a human hospital, and you're dealing with something as terrible as this for a patient who comes in. Well, you can't just send them home because there's no home to go to, right? So there are always um, complicated situations on this planet. The goal is teamwork, right? The goal is to have people of various backgrounds, disciplines working together to solve complicated problems. Now, there was a social media campaign that happens every January. So be on the lookout for that. This is a, a Facebook tagline uh, of One Health Awareness Month. So if you're not a fan of One Health yet, uh, hopefully by January you will be and to raise awareness. But keep in mind, it doesn't stop at awareness. Awareness is only the first step to action. I would say a success, a successful campaign is if you were to inspire action in others to create a positive impact on this planet. And I will leave you with this. Karen Nyberg, a NASA astronaut, she said, every single part of the earth reacts with every other part. It's one thing. Think to yourself, what would her background be? Would she be a biologist? Would she be an ecologist? Why is she saying this? Is she an astrophysicist? She's a an astronaut. She's actually a mechanical engineer. And why would a mechanical engineer be saying something like this, talking about animal conservation? It's probably because she's looking out and she sees this one world, this one planet that we're all on and she sees this fine line here. That fine line is what's protecting all of us, regardless of where we are on this planet. And it's our responsibility as science advocates, as engineering advocates, as STEM advocates, that we need to be able to communicate efficiently with people outside of our bubble in order to protect this beautiful planet of ours. So why is science communication important? So we can advance science, so we can make people, animals, and the planet healthier. 
This is the book that has some of the material that I've included today in the talk, plus a lot more. Um, and there's even examples of how you can better understand people who have uh, who are working in policy. And I thank you all very much for your attention, for your participation, um, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you again um, for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for an amazing session and uh, giving us insights about One Health Education. No doubt it is a very new topic for us and the one that's not been uh, given the attention that it needs to. I'll be just asking a few questions that we are receiving in the comment sections too. And the ones that I have in my mind, the first one would be, what exactly was your inspiration behind these sessions? Like your basic target are children. So why exactly children? What was the main inspiration behind that? Excellent question. Okay, there are so many answers to this. Okay, I challenge you all to think when you, when did you want to go into science? How old were you? I guess when we hard. were in elementary schools, because when yeah. everyone was asking, our only answer was we wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> when we didn't even knew what was that, we just wanted to answer, we wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> right. So research has showed that about 80% of scientists have figured that they wanted to go into science one way or the other by the age of 13. So that's one thing. Number two, you as a professional or an aspiring professional in the STEM field, you owe it to the world to be as good a communicator as possible. And the best way to do it from, let's say a selfish perspective is to go to an audience that's honest and that challenges you to explain your niche knowledge in a easy to understand way. And the best way to do it is with children. Third reason, I'll leave it like that. Third reason is think back when you were a child, if you had a, a real life scientist come into your classroom and talk to you and look relatable and look like a person that's, you know, you could see on the street, it, it's mind boggling to see science come to life. And you, like it or not, would be seen as a science role model. So you're giving back to the community if you do make the effort to talk about science, talk about STEM, talk about engineering, talk about whatever your niche knowledge is with children. Perfect. That was such a mind-blowing answer, Dr. Thompson. Um, Dr. Thompson, as I introduced you, I've been saying that your introduction mind blew me. Like, you are a veterinarian. You are also teaching side by side, and you had a very deep love for music. I just wanted to ask, how do you manage this all? while doing these things side by side so perfectly because living the, the age that we are living in right now, we just try to focus on studies and just acting according to the timeline that has been set by our society and uh, the norms and conditions. And we don't want to go into things like music or something like that, something that deeply interests us because we are so busy pleasing our parents and even the society uh, society norms. So I just wanted to ask you, how did you find time for each and everything? How did you exactly discover your passion and you paved the path so that you are here now and accomplishing such big things? Thank you for that question. That's a big question. And I will provide, I, I'm an honest person. I'm gonna provide an honest answer. I, um, so I, I started music when I was very small. Okay. Everybody in my family is a musician. So that was, that was, if your last name is Thompson, you're going to be a musician. That's the way it worked in my family. Music has taught me a lot, a lot. Um, it taught me how to organize my time. It taught me how to work towards goals. It taught me how to work under pressure. Um, and it, I remember this one teacher when I was in secondary school who uh, was managing about 50 
secondary school students and we were in this wind ensemble. Okay. So think of it like a band and we had to cover so much material, so much music within an hour and a half for a rehearsal for something like a two hour concert, for instance, how did we manage that? Well, the thing is I learned by observing what he did was he had a chalkboard and he said from six to six ten we do this regardless of what happens at 609 we are stopping at 610 from 610 to 640 we do this from 640 you see and on and on and on so that way he highlights where he needs to work on or where we all need to work on because we're an ensemble we're a group and we achieve those goals and ultimately the concerts go very well because he uses his time wisely. And once I saw that work so well, I used that throughout university. So I did two bachelor's degrees at the same time, which is nuts. I was doing really double the work because there was minimal overlap between music and science. But the way I got through it was that I organized my time in such a way that I recognized what I needed to improve upon and focused on those, um, those items in a very concentrated way for X amount of time. And then I just moved on to the next thing. And that's how I got through undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate degrees. Um, and then I'll leave you with a story so that we can move on to the next, uh, next question. Even though I did two undergraduate degrees, did double the work the whole time, I applied to veterinary school and I did not get in. And I was distraught. It, I thought that it was the biggest failure, but ultimately, ultimately it was a blessing in disguise because what I did in the interim was I moved to an area that was only French speaking and I was teaching English uh, language learners in a secondary school. So I was teaching students from 11 years old to 16 years old in that school. At night, I was teaching adults. And then when uh, before those that year, I was teaching elementary primary school students music. Um, so after that year, I really appreciated what it was like to be a teacher. And I loved it but I didn't want to not go to vet school. I still wanted to be a vet. So I go to veterinary school. I learn about this thing called One Health. And I'm thinking, why didn't I learn about this 20 years before? So I made it a mission of mine, uh, fast forward several years. And when I'm doing clinical work, clinical medicine in the animal hospital, I do my 10 to 12 hour shifts. And then I come home and then I create lessons for children and adults about One Health. Um, it was a way that I could relax. It was a way that I could uh, practice my creativity. Um, and it served a purpose because I knew that, I knew that children and adults would benefit from these lessons. So fast forward, One Health lessons uh, now exist. It's around the globe, which I'm incredibly grateful for. I could not have done this alone. This was a lot of uh, contribution from wonderful volunteers around the world. And I'm really happy to be able to answer that important question that you asked. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That was in my mind for such a long time. When I read about your introduction, I was like totally amazed. And you are just like a living example for us that it's never too late. And you can just turn your life experiences into something that can be really beneficial at any moment in your life. We just think about it like being a 20 year old and 23. We just need to get our jobs done and just have everything according to plan. But sometimes not having things according to plan can be a biggest blessing in disguise yeah but let me tell you i cried so much when i got the rejection <laughs> letter i cried so much <laughs> we're all human right <laughs> um true, true. just keep it going if you have a passion and you have a mission don't give up 
And Dr. Thompson, what do you think about the company? How much it pay, plays an important role in getting your dreams and your passions, being surrounded by the right type of people that really push you forward towards your goals? Because uh, we are like social animals. We love to interact and we love to give others our ideas. But today we think like being alone and just working on our own is the best strategy we have. So what do you think that having good company, good supportive friends, do they really make a difference yes yes i could not with any if anybody who you hear is successful know that in their past they have had failures and i would say i was a professional at it because there have been so many so many rejections so many failures um but the key is grit right the key is to find your support network and if you don't see a support network um, that's evident, I hope that you look, in with, look within yourself and think about why you actually want to achieve a certain goal. And if that goal is to benefit the greater good, to make the planet uh, better for the next generation, then it's worth doing. Don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to people who say you can't do something. Just do it, just prove them wrong. Um, and if you are fortunate enough to have a support system, make sure that you express your gratitude to them. And I try my best with the interns um, that have been working with me for One Health Lessons. Um, it's an incredible group. I'm inspired every time I speak with them. I speak with them. I mentor them. And in a way they mentor me. Um, I speak with them every Saturday at the minimum. Uh, and we work together to advance the mission of One Health Lessons. So um, don't go out alone. Very well explained. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, winding this session up with my last question, that would be that when I see you, you already have accomplished so much. You are having your own private organization and having one lessons and obviously they are going amazing and successful. Uh, if I would like to ask you once again, now what is your goal right now? Something that you are looking forward to? at this stage when you have already accomplished a lot, but still we are human beings and we do have goals that we want to keep progressing on. So what is your goal right now and what future you want to see for One Health Lessons? Thank you. So I'll, I'll say this in two different ways. What my goal, what my personal goal is I wanna give these types of talks in person I want to go around the world. I want to, sh I want to not just share stories. I want to create stories with people around the world. I want to speak and learn um, amongst different cultures. Um, I love traveling. And once COVID is addressed to um, an appropriate degree around the world and when it's safe to travel, I really hope to be invited as a speaker at various conferences um, because that would be incredible. The other thing that I would really, really like to do, and this is what I've been saying for years, but the thing is when people say, what's your dream job? Um, I say, well, it doesn't exist yet, but I'm going to make it exist. So this is what I really want is to um, live in different areas of the world, learn the, uh, the culture to a, a to an extent where I can help train the trainers of, um, who want to teach about One Health in a inappropriate way to meet the needs of that community. Um, does that exist? Yet? No, that doesn't exist. Do I want that? That's exactly what I want. Now with One Health Lessons, um, the organization as a whole, um, what the future uh, has in store for that, that I can see is having a lot more lessons available on the website. And of course the corresponding translations um, also to create um, more outreach programs. And right now we have a handful of One Health Lessons ambassadors, but we want more. So to bump up the train the trainer 
um, program in order to inspire more people to attain those uh, in vital skills of being a fantastic science communicator and then also bringing that message to communities in the mountains, in the valleys, everywhere on this planet. That's the ultimate goal. So thanks, Sarah. Very Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. We really wish one day we can see you in Pakistan and we would love to see you here and have one-to-one face-to-face communication with you instead when we don't have any restraints of timings or internet connection problems and just we can talk to each other freely. Just really hoping to see that day really, really soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. It was an amazing session with such an amazing topic, a new topic for our audience. We are having an overwhelming response on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for such an enlightening and comprehensive session on One Health Lessons. We truly appreciate having this important quest, uh, topic answered by you in detail. And I would like to address my our audience. If you want to become a volunteer lesson leader, you can send emails at lessonleadersprogram at gmail.com. You can also visit www.onehealthlessons.com and be a part of it. We also have Mohammed Abdullah with us. He's a very active, ambassador and he's also a part of Multiomics. We can also get you in contact with him and you can also be a part of such an amazing cause. Once again, I would like to thank you from the deepest of my heart, from the whole Multiomics team for sparing your precious time and being with us to, here today and giving such inspirational words today. They were really, really mind-blowing and they went straight to my heart to be quite honest. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your time. And regardless of where you are on this planet, I hope you stay healthy and safe. And thank you again, um, Sarah, for this fantastic opportunity. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Now I would like to wind up the session with these few lines that there are no limits to what you can accomplish except the limits you place on your thinking. Thank you so much for your time and patience. Until next time, this is your host, Sarah Malik, signing off. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Thompson. My pleasure. Thanks so much for this opportunity. The pleasure is all my ours, Dr. Thompson. Okay, well, have a good night. I know it's getting late there for you. And um, yeah, just let me know if there's a way um, for me to share the material and, and we'll go forward. Take care. Sure, Dr. Thompson, I'll be in contact with you. Thank you so much once again. Have a good morning, good evening, and have a good day. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye, Dr. Thompson. Um, can someone end this on you, uh, YouTube?